Noah gave a warning message to the world. He told them the hour of God's judgment had come and showed them their need to enter into the Ark of Refuge. This judgment hour was a testing time in which all were faced with a choice to accept or reject the message. Then their probation closed and the door of the Ark was shut and the execution of judgment came by flood when the waters covered the earth. The events at the end of time will follow this pattern exactly. So walk with me now into the future. I'm your host, Jeff Rich. I'm walking along a timeline that spans the length of an entire football field. Every inch of this field represents one year of time. As you can see, this timeline really puts things into perspective. Previously, we saw how a prophecy in the book of Daniel foretold the very year when the days of Noah for the time of the end would begin. We saw how this 2300-day prophecy began in 457 BC with the decree of Artaxerxes and how one day being a symbol for one year, it would last 2300 years. This prophecy extended well beyond the days of Jesus, all the way down to the year of 1844. This is when the first angel's message began to repeat the warning message announcing the hour of his judgment has come. This testing time lasted 120 years in the days of Noah, but in our day, the judgment message has been sounding now for over 170 years. As the message of Noah spread throughout the earth, so today the three angels' messages are circling the globe, warning its inhabitants to enter into the Ark of the Everlasting Covenant before the execution of the final judgment. Before the flood, there came a time when the last message of mercy had been given, and with the completed Ark, and its open door set before the people, they were brought to make a choice. This is where we are today. The second and third angel's messages warns us of the world's last great crisis that will place multitudes of the earth in the valley of decision, just as it was in the days of Noah. As we spoke of, of Noah preaching a, a day of judgment, a day of decision, you're either on or you're not on the ark, you know, take your pick. Um, so he was a preacher of righteousness. And so by promoting and, and really saying this is the only way that it works is to obey God's law, he was condemning, as it were, by contrast, the false systems of worship. But it's clear that the majority of the population were not comfortable with God's requirements, so they must have set up some of their own. By the worldwide proliferation of false worship and idolatry in the days of Noah, the people were well prepared to reject the invitation into the ark. And the innumerable systems of false worship in our day will yield a similar result in the rejection of the everlasting covenant. But God will leave none who desire a knowledge of the truth to be deceived. Both his mercy and his justice demand a clear delineation between truth and error, that all may have sufficient light to make their decision. Then the genuine seeker of truth is able to untangle himself from error, and those who choose not to are left without excuse. For this purpose, God sends the second angel's message.
there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, what is the wine? Wine represents false doctrine in Scripture. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The effect of this wine is deception, because it is fermented wine which leads people away from the truth. So in contrast to the first angel's message, which presents true doctrine, Babylon is preaching wine or false doctrine. The darkness of night obscures from view the truth about the world around us. Confusion, like the darkness, has concealed from us the truth about the character of God. False doctrines and ideas are like the trees of the forest that change with the seasons. They blow about in the wind and rise and fall through the centuries. There's only one way to dispel the darkness, and that is with light. Peter tells us we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. And with the light from these prophecies, we are able to identify this system called Babylon. The system of Babylon is reflected by this woman uh, in Revelation chapter 17. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The first three symbols that help us to identify Babylon are the woman, the beast, and the seven heads. In order to arrive at a correct understanding of these symbols, we must allow the Bible to define them for us. So here's what God has to say about the prophetic symbol of a woman. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Zion was the name given to the people of God. As we read in Isaiah, Say unto Zion, Thou art my people. So in the Old Testament, a woman is used by God as a symbol to represent his people. In the New Testament, a woman still is used to represent God's people in the form of his church. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. In the book of Revelation, there are two women. One is a virgin dressed in white, representing God's church, and the other woman named Babylon is a harlot, meaning she represents a counterfeit church, and she is the one sitting upon a beast. Once again, allowing the Bible to interpret its own symbols, we turn to the book of Daniel to define the symbol of the beast. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. According to Daniel, a beast is a symbol for a kingdom or a nation. Since the Bible uses a woman as a symbol for a church and the beast for a symbol of a nation, then this symbol of a woman sitting upon a beast is a symbol of a church in control of a nation or a kingdom. In other words, this nation is both a church and state power. Next, John says that this beast has seven heads, and the Bible tells us what these heads represent, just six verses later. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The fact that this woman sits upon this beast with seven heads tells us this church and state power is located near seven mountains. John goes on to describe this woman in detail. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Our fourth clue is that this woman or church named Babylon is described as a harlot meaning she has committed adultery against God by forsaking his covenant. So this church does not represent God's people. Instead, it represents a counterfeit church. Our fifth characteristic is the woman's appearance. 
She is described being arrayed with purple and scarlet colors. Having allowed the Bible to define its own symbols, we see God telling us Babylon is a church and state power located around seven mountains, and it is a counterfeit church that appears primarily in purple and scarlet colors. There's only one church that fits this definitive description, the Roman Catholic Church, also known as the Papacy. So let's investigate the evidence for this conclusion. Vatican City is the only church and state nation in the world. It is known as the City on Seven Hills, and its primary colors are purple and scarlet. During the Protestant Reformation, many of the reformers, including Thomas Cranmer, John Wesley, William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, Felipe Melanchthon, John Huss, Martin Luther, and hundreds of others all concluded the papacy was the harlot of Babylon identified in the scriptures. I, for my part, will set free my own mind and deliver my conscience by declaring aloud to the Pope and to all Papists that the papacy is, in truth, nothing else than the kingdom of Babylon and the very Antichrist. For who is the man of sin and the son of perdition but he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church while he yet sits in the church as if he were God? All these conditions have now, for many ages, been fulfilled by the papal tyranny. First Principles of the Reformation by Martin Luther, page 197. The second angel's message is a warning against the wine of Babylon and the intoxicating influence of its false doctrines which have deceived the entire world. Yes, even the Christian world. This great feat was not accomplished at once, but subtly over several centuries. When you think about Jesus' statement uh, just before he left, he said, this gospel shall be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. We see the disciples going out preaching this gospel, but we see that the end did not come. Uh, the reason, I believe, is because that gospel became tainted, and a different gospel began to go out into all the world. In part two of this series, we saw how the everlasting gospel and the everlasting covenant are revealed through the sanctuary. But now we're going to take a look at a prophecy in the book of Daniel where the sanctuary comes under attack. That's what's really being described here, an attack on the gospel and the covenant by replacing it with a counterfeit covenant. According to Daniel chapter 8, the Bible talks about this little horn power that would defile the sanctuary. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And the little horn, there's no doubt as you look at the sequence of the chapter, that it's speaking about the Roman Catholic papacy. Daniel's prophecy is telling us that the papacy would magnify himself and exalt himself even above Christ, the Prince of the Host. And by the papacy, the truths represented by the sanctuary and Jesus' ministry in heaven would be cast to the ground. Instead of looking to Jesus as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, the people were taught to look to human priests in a counterfeit sanctuary upon the earth. So what you have is during the Dark Ages, you have this power rising upon a scene that actually attacked every article of furniture and the truth they represented. The altar of sacrifice, representing the sacrifice of Christ, was attacked, altered in a sense, uh, and a new teaching came upon the scene that said the sacrifice of Christ was not sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. If you wanted to be forgiven, you had to pay money. You had to uh, perform indulgences. You had to you know, do penance, and so the sacrifice of Christ was not sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. And the one-time sacrifice of Christ 
is now being repeated perpetually at every Mass. And so the cross, in effect, has lost its power. The laver, uh, which represented baptism, that too was altered. We must repent and be baptized, which means you must be of age to understand that you have sinned and repent on, on free will. And so this teaching was replaced by infant sprinkling. And then when you look at the, um, the table of showbread, that represents the Bible. The Bible was, during the Dark Ages, was taken away. It is forbidden for laymen to read the Old and New Testaments. We forbid them most severely to have the above books in the popular vernacular. The lords of the district shall carefully seek out the heretics in dwellings, hovels, and forests, and even their underground retreats shall be entirely wiped out. Pope Gregory IX in the Council of Telusinum, 1229 A.D., Canons 14 and 2. And so when you take away the Word of God, you take away the truth of God, and you have people that are now bound to superstition, um, and bound to tradition over the Word of God. The people were told that you couldn't read the Bible for yourself. Instead of the bread of life, and we partaking of that in terms of the scripture, somebody else now has to interpret it for us. And uh, so the, the truth and the importance of the Bible being the foundation, that was lost sight of. The altar of incense, which represented Christ's intercession on our behalf, was cast down. And in this place was set up, you know, what was called the confessional booth, a two-compartment room divided by a curtain with a man sitting in the place of God hearing the confessions of other men. And uh, so the people were told, you can't have direct access to God. You must come to priests and confess your sins to them. The priest came and he placed himself in between the sinner and the Lord and said, no, you must go through me. You need to confess your sins to me. And again, barriers being put up between man and God. Just the individual's ability to go directly to God was lost. The seven branch candlestick represented the church. Uh, this too was attacked in the persecutions that happened uh, during this time period known as the Dark Ages. The Whitney scene was was trying to be stamped out. And that's what you find the, the candlesticks is all about, witness. Anyone who differed with the teaching of this dominant church or this dominant system was persecuted, burned at the stake, you know, tortured in, in many different ways in order for them to fall in line with the system. And so in so many different ways, you see the sanctuary being, being cast down. Then you get up into the most holy place, where is the Ark of the Covenant. That's where you find the Ten Commandments, inside the Ark. The Bible says this power would think to change times and laws, Daniel 7.25. And the Reformation clearly showed, or preached with power, that they saw the papal power who said that it had the right to change God's law as representing this power. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. The prophecy foretold the Catholic Church would think to change times and laws. And the Church acknowledges this fact the Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. And as you look at the Roman Catholic uh, Church theology, you'll find that the second commandment basically in the catechisms is eradicated. It doesn't appear. They deleted one commandment, which was dealing with the imagery. You can't have an image. And so now they have a problem. They have nine, only nine commandments. So they took the tenth commandment and they divided it in half. In addition to the sanctuary being cast down in terms of many of the doctrines and the law, we also lost the idea of the Sabbath. They took the seventh day Sabbath, which uh, pointed to uh, Saturday and said by the power and authority of the church, uh, we have changed that day to Sunday 
the first day of the week. Re-emphasizing the change of this commandment, a Catholic priest said this in 1903. It is well to remind the Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, and all other Christians that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church, and those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. Mankind who used to understand the keeping of Sabbath was part of the Christian life in the early church was now being told that, no, the first day of the week is the new Sabbath set up by the Roman church because she says she has the power to do so. The safe way is always the way of scripture. If God said so, and I let myself be convinced by someone that God did not say so, then who's to blame? I'm to blame. Now, the idea that God's Sabbath, for instance, has changed is ludicrous. When you think about the only commandment that begins with the word remember is the one they want us to forget. And so those are the unchangeable precepts of truth. And uh, he put that in the Ark of the Covenant. That was lost during the Dark Ages. Through the centuries, the sanctuary and the truths it represents were cast to the ground. In other words, they were made void because the truth about the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary was counterfeited by the false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church upon the earth. There are many more false teachings that make up the wine of Babylon, but one that strikes directly at the very heart of the gospel is that relating to the covenant God established with his people. Jesus used pure, unfermented wine as a symbol of his covenant, whereas the Bible describes the counterfeit covenant of Babylon as fermented wine. Jesus in the New Testament, as he's um, giving the disciples the last supper, he gives them the bread and says, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he gives him the wine, which is uh, grape juice, and he says, this is the blood of the covenant, or the the New Testament. In fact, Jesus said, this is the New Testament in my blood. The wine symbolizes the new covenant. What is the new covenant? God says, I will write my law in your heart and in your mind. When Babylon offers this counterfeit wine, they're offering a counterfeit covenant. This wine is counterfeit wine. And according to Proverbs 31, the Bible says it is not for kings to drink wine or strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law. So this wine is fermented, uh, it is impure, and when you drink this wine, it leads you to forget what God said to remember. And what did God say to remember? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So this is the wine that is being given to the world at this time. So you see that every piece of furniture, including the law of God, was taken out. So everything that the Bible says that this power would do, they did in the allotted period of time. And so here you've got these, these, this total casting down of the truths represented in the sanctuary. So the whole sanctuary, all the way from the door to the, the Holy of Holies, had been corrupted, and it needed to be restored. The prophecy of Daniel 8:14 tells us unto 2300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed at a certain period of time all the truths that had been cast down by this little horn power would ultimately be restored and so the entire sanctuary is cast down and trodden underfoot by this man of sin protestant reformation brings it back and over a period of 500 years that exact thing happened god began to bring different movements upon the scene that would restore each article of furniture almost century by century over a period of 500 years. And so you have John Wycliffe coming upon the scene in the 1300s. He translated the Bible into the language of the people and thus set off, as it were, the Reformation. Martin Luther is born in the 1400s, uh, begins a Protestant Reformation in the, in the 1500s, and he 
uh, in essence restores the truth that Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. You don't have to pay money, you don't have to do penance, it is by faith in his sacrifice for us that we are forgiven of our sins. John Calvin uh, comes upon the scene in the 1500s, founder of the Presbyterian movement. Uh, Calvin has a very strong burden for prayer, um, wrote extensively on prayer, basically taught that you don't need to go through priests in order to have access to God. You can have direct access to the throne of God yourself um, in the 1600s. John Smith and uh, Roger Williams become the founders of the Baptist movement. And their special burden is the restoration of the true mode of baptism. You must repent and then be baptized. You can't be sprinkled. True baptism is a symbol of being fully submersed, fully buried, and fully brought up into newness of life. And so the Baptist movement restores the true mode of baptism. In the 1700s, you have John Wesley who comes up on the scene. He's the founder of the Methodist movement. And John Wesley has a very strong burden for the lay evangelist. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine. The Methodist movement, in essence, added to everything else that the movements before it had brought back. Now they add this element of evangelism. Go out there and let your light shine. So by the 1800s, there's one article of furniture left to be restored. It is the Ark of the Covenant, specifically the Seventh-day Sabbath. And it is in this century that God brings on the scene the Seventh-day Adventist movement that would focus specifically on the law of God and the commandment that had been cast down, which is the Seventh-day Sabbath. So in essence, you have these two prophecies in the book of Daniel, one stating that the sanctuary would be defiled, the other one stating that it would be purified at the end of 2300 days, and to a T, you find this confirmed in history. The fact that this everlasting gospel is again preached in 1844 simply signifies that all the things that had been altered and uh, disrupted in the true everlasting gospel were fully restored by 1844. At the same time that the everlasting gospel is fully restored and begins to go forward again, it is at that time that the judgment begins. And so now you have this message going forward. It is an end time message, and it is a message that actually prepares the world for the coming of Christ. Just like Noah was calling people into the ark and out of the crowd, God in the last days is calling people out of the false teachings of Babylon. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Come out of her, my people. You come out of the false and you come into the true. If uh, God's people are in Babylon, it must represent churches that claim to serve the Lord, or else God wouldn't call them my people. And so God is inviting people into the true worship. And in the days of Noah, the collective mindset ridiculed the plan of salvation. They refused to go into the ark. And there is a way of the ark in the end because there's an ark of the covenant which points to the law, which is within the sanctuary. Uh, those that reject it here, they rejected it there. But the people are being deceived. They are not by choice accepting these things. So as God enlightens people with his spirit and they realize the truths of the Bible, they will make a choice and they will come out of the system that rejects the way of God. The Sabbath isn't being kept where I'm at. You know, the commandments aren't being preached where I'm at. Uh, you know, I'm not hearing that we're in the hour of God's judgment. And, and so they say, hey, where I'm at, the first angel's message isn't being preached, so I'm actually going to get out. When I first heard this message preached to me, that the denomination to which I belong was Babylon and that it was a false method of worship, it, it frightened me. Uh, I came out of the Roman Catholic Church 
and I knew many good people within the Roman Catholic system. But when I saw that their teachings were contrary to the scripture, I had no choice. Uh, being a sentient human being, I looked at it and said, well, the only logical conclusion is to follow what God has said in his Bible, not the traditions of men. And it was very difficult because my whole family is Roman Catholic, and they still are to, to this day. And this is what we need to do to let people know that Babylon has fallen. It's twice fallen. Uh, not only uh, Roman Catholicism, but also the, the daughters of the harlot that's addressed in Revelation 17, that they too have become spiritual Babylon. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's described as the mother of harlots and abominations. So she's a mother and she has daughters. So when this second angel's message goes forward, uh, I believe the message is speaking uh, generally about the mother, but more specifically about the daughters. So who are the daughters? They are the Protestant churches that came out of her that are no longer protesting, that have rejected the first angel's message. So very clearly the second angel's message calls people to come out of the religious systems where the first angel's message is not being practiced. The Protestant churches who have turned their back on the sanctuary message, on the law of God, on the Sabbath, is what is being pointed out here. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Revelation 18 picks it up by saying, come out of her, my people. So it is a call for God's people who are in these fallen systems to come out of them because these fallen systems are teaching that there is some other way to the throne of God when there is only one way to the throne of God and that is through the pattern uh, given to us in the sanctuary. Instead of protesting the traditions of men and the wine of Babylon, these churches have drunk of it and poured it out upon their congregations. The term Babylon, confusion, may be appropriately applied to these bodies. All professing to derive their doctrines from the Bible, yet divided into almost innumerable sects with widely conflicting creeds and theories. But religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the people know not what to believe is truth. Notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exist in the churches which constitute Babylon, the great body of Christ's true believers are still to be found in their communion. I need it, Lord! There are many of these who have never seen the special truths for this time. Not a few are dissatisfied with their present condition and are longing for clearer light. Take your hands off of God's property! They look in vain for the image of Christ in the churches with which they are connected. As these bodies depart further and further from the truth and ally themselves more closely with the world, the difference between the two classes will widen and it will finally result in separation. I can remember when I first heard this message and I'd have to say that I was one of those people that was in Babylon. Now, I, I was a pagan, but when I first came to Jesus, I joined just your typical evangelical church and did not know these things that uh, we're talking about. And so when I learned the truth about the Sabbath and I learned about the message of coming out of Babylon, it was a struggle. It was, it was painful. For one thing, I think I was a little angry that I felt I'd been deceived by, maybe they were sincere, but teachers that were not telling me the whole message. Uh, I was frustrated. I went to several different pastors and said, you know, why are we worshiping on the first day of the week when the Bible clearly says the seventh day is the Sabbath? And I might have asked 10 different pastors. I probably got 11 or 12 different answers. They didn't agree with each other. That to me immediately said something was wrong. And secondly, uh, it was a struggle because my friends were all in these churches and I had to make a decision. Uh, am I willing to not only lose my friends, but my employment was at risk and I had to turn down jobs because keeping the Sabbath means you keep it holy, you don't work that day. 
And so, you know, I went through um, some personal trials to take a stand. But, you know, in the end, I look back and God provided, He blessed, and uh, whenever we step out in faith and follow Him, ultimately, it'll be better, and He'll bless. He'll work miracles for us. The first and second angel's messages will be challenging for most Christians. These warnings bring into question many of the fundamental beliefs Christians have held their whole lives. I imagine hearing the solemn warnings of a global flood pronounced by Noah in his day challenged the people in the same way. Many of those people professed to be worshipers of God, but they had drifted so far off into false worship that they really believed Noah to be delusional, so they rejected the call to come into the ark. The wine of Babylon and the false systems of worship are having the same effect today. They'll prevent many people, even Christians, from receiving the first angel's message. This message is calling them to enter into the ark of the everlasting covenant. It's a call to worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea. We saw how this message points back to the Sabbath commandment because it's both a memorial of his creation and a sign of the everlasting covenant. By resting on the Sabbath day, we show that we are worshiping the true God and that we have entered into the everlasting covenant by embracing its symbol of the Sabbath. But many sincere Christians have been deceived. They believe themselves to be worshipers of the true God and partakers of his covenant, while they disregard the very heart of his covenant. Although deceived, God knows many have been faithfully living up to the light they have, but if they continue in error and reject the truths found in the three angels' messages, they will find themselves outside the ark like those who rejected the pleas of Noah. God is love, and because he is love, one thing he cannot do is force someone to accept his mercy against their will. Love beckons, love invites, love pleads, but love can never violate free will upon which its very existence depends. God embraces and rejoices in those who come to him, and he respects the decisions of those who do not. But this is not so with the great adversary. He'll use any means necessary, including coercion and force, to secure homage and to achieve his objectives. For centuries, Satan has been preparing his most powerful deceptions for his final onslaught. But love, on the other hand, would have every person to make an intelligent decision of their own free will. And for this purpose, God sends the third angel's message to reveal the enemy's plans, that all may have sufficient light, that none would be deceived when they stand in the valley of decision. them saying with a loud voice if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The third angel's message speaks about those who receive the mark of the beast. You have really the most fearful curse found in the Bible is what happens to those who receive the mark of the beast. And it's connected with false worship and a judgment that comes on those who worship against the worship of the Bible. But not only does he warn the world to worship the Creator in the first angel's message, but he warns the world not to worship the beast or his image in the third angel's message. So the issue at the end of time clearly is going to be over worship. Uh, the devil is not trying to get us to not worship. He's trying to get us to counterfeit worship. In the last days, the devil and the beast power doesn't say, don't worship. They say, worship, but worship the beast. 
we see a parallel with Noah's day. The, the population of the earth is divided into two groups. There's the majority, unfortunately, on the outside of the boat with the mark of the beast, and the minority inside the boat with the seal of God. Even today, the identity of the beast remains a mystery to most. Popular culture has made these prophecies the subjects of countless movies and books, and this has led people into all kinds of speculation. And by doing this, it's diminished their significance and has buried their true meaning under a cloak of confusion. The truth is, we can know exactly what the mark of the beast is. After all, that's the reason God gave us this warning. First, we need to realize no one will be saved through this crisis by knowing what the mark of the beast is. When this last conflict comes, only those that have the seal of God in their foreheads will be preserved through the last great conflict. So what's really important is that we know how we can receive the seal of God. So before we look at the mark of the beast, let's first learn about the seal of God. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. In the days of Noah, uh, Noah was sealed in the ark. Um, simply meant that he couldn't get out, no one could get in. Once in the ark, the Bible says the Lord shut him in. The word shut and the word seal are used interchangeably throughout the scriptures. For example, God said to Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Therefore, the word shut and the word seal have the same meaning. So when the Bible says the Lord shut him in, it's the same as saying the Lord sealed him in. Noah was sealed in the Ark of the Covenant made with him, and he was preserved through the flood. They were sealed on the inside. They were, they were saved from the, the trial that was going to come on the whole world. There's not another time of trouble in human history that's going to compare in intensity to the one that God's people are going to go through. In order to go through this period of severe trial, God's people have to be sealed before. And the purpose of the seal is, first of all, for God to identify who are His, so that the angels uh, are clear as to who they need to protect during this time of trouble. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16 speaks about sealing the law among God's disciples. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So here we discover that there is a relationship between God's seal and his law. When you look at the ancient seals used in biblical times, they always contained three elements. They contained the name of the issuing authority, the king, or whoever it might be. They contain his title, uh, and they can contain his jurisdiction. A seal has got the title, it's got the name, it's got the territory. And when you look through the Ten Commandments, it's only the Fourth Commandment that speaks of God as the Creator. It's got the name, it's got the territory. Uh, the, the ruler of heaven and earth, and his, his jurisdiction. So right in the Sabbath commandment, you've got the seal of God. And so it's unique. It really identifies who we worship. Just as in Noah's day, getting on that ark represented a, a, an acceptance of all of the, mo the morality that God promoted, the, the Ten Commandments, the observance of, the, of God's will. So at the end of time, the acceptance of the Sabbath uh, indicates the acceptance of, of all of the, the moral requirements of God. The seal according to the Bible, can be summed up in that one commandment, the fourth commandment. Not because that commandment is by itself a saving commandment, but because that commandment gives authority to the entire law. Without the fourth commandment, the entire Decalogue can be anyone's commandment, but this is the Lord, your creator, and therefore it gives the seal of authority 
to the entire law. By keeping that day, according to the commandment, you are acknowledging the authority of the lawgiver. And that is why it is important to keep the Sabbath. And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. The Sabbath really determines who you're worshiping. Keeping the Sabbath shows that we have committed our lives to our Creator, to our Savior. If the Sabbath is the sign of God as the Creator, the mark of the beast must be an opposite sign that this power created to rival the sign that God established. What was the sign that God established that He's the Creator? The Sabbath. So what would be the mark that distinguishes the beast uh, and demanding worship from people? It would have to be another day. The last war in the book of Revelation is a war over worship. The third angel's message warns us twice that many will worship the beast. This is a violation of the first commandment that says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The third angel's message warns us twice that many will worship the image of the beast. This is a violation of the second commandment, which prohibits the worship of images and idols. We have been warned, many will receive the name of the beast, a counterfeit of the third commandment, to not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And finally, the third angel's message warns us twice not to receive the mark of the beast, a counterfeit of the seal of God in the fourth commandment, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. So if you look at the parallel between having no other God, the number, the, the name, the number, the image, then there's a Sabbath, which is the mark. They actually all parallel. It all revolves around that first table of the Decalogue. The first four of the Ten Commandments are laws that define how we're to worship God. So when the first angel's message commands us to worship Him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, it's pointing us to the Ark of the Everlasting Covenant through the worship of the Creator. The second angel's message warns us of the false worship that will confuse people and lead them away from the covenant. And the third angel's message warns us about the beast that will try to prevent people from entering into the covenant by forcing them to disregard the sign of worship to the Creator and receive instead the sign of worship to the beast. So just who is this beast? And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. John sees this beast having seven heads and ten horns, this is exactly the same description of the beast in Revelation chapter 17 that was carrying the woman named Babylon dressed in purple and scarlet colors. Note that this beast also has seven heads and ten horns. Back in chapter 13, John saw the first beast rise up out of the sea. In chapter 17, the sea is defined this way. The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So what God is revealing is that this beast in Revelation 13 will rise to power in a populated area. The beast in Revelation 17 is carrying a woman who is full of the names of blasphemy. And when we go back to the beast in Revelation 13, it also has upon his heads the names of blasphemy. The descriptions of these two beasts are the same because they're both referring to the same power. The beast John saw rise up out of the sea is the same power he saw carrying the woman named Babylon, who we already saw represents the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Eventually, by, through studying through who is the beast and determining the understanding of the, the, the beast to be, represent the system of the papacy and the Catholic Church, you find that their special claim to mark of worship is their prerogative that they claim of having changed the law of God. Changing it. Just completely changing it. 
taking the fourth commandment and making it apply not to the Sabbath of creation, not to the sign of the Creator's power and authority, but to Sunday. This is what the Catholic Church claims to be their mark of authority. And this is the mark of the, of the beast at the, at the very end of time. An archbishop from the Roman Catholic Church said the following in 1562. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures, because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by command of Christ, but by its own authority. The Catholic Church points to their changing of the law of God as proof that her authority is above the Bible and claims that this change is a sign of its authority. In 1893, the Catholic Church distributed a first edition of an article that was later retitled, Rome's Challenge, Why Do Protestants Keep Sunday? In this publication, the Catholic author poses this question to Protestants. It is not yet too late for Protestants to redeem themselves. Will they do it? Will they stand consistently upon the Protestant profession? Will they indeed take the written word only, the scripture alone, as their sole authority and sole standard? Or will they still hold the indefensible, self-contradictory, and suicidal doctrine and practice of following the authority of the Catholic Church? And, where the sign of her authority, will they keep the Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day, according to Scripture? Or will they keep the Sunday, according to the tradition of the Catholic Church? The, the doing away with the uh, reminder of God's authority as, as the Creator the doing away with the acceptance of the sign of faith, doing away with those things uh, strikes at the very heart of our relationship with God and all the, that flows out of that. The most defiant thing that could be done to challenge the authority of God would be to change His law, because the law is the foundation of His government. And the papacy claims this change as a sign of her authority. Those that worship the Creator will honor the day God sanctified as a sign of His authority and covenant. And those that trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment will receive the mark of the beast because He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which He chooses to obey instead of God. This is the central conflict in this last war over worship. As this crisis escalates and becomes universal, every person will receive the sign of the power they choose to obey in the forehead, or in the hand. It's depicted in both the forehead and in the hand. Now to really understand what that entails, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And these words which I teach thee today, you will take them and teach them to your children. They will be upon your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. Now, well, first we need to understand what are these words. These words are the commandments just given in the previous chapter. In uh, Exodus chapter 13, verse 9, he says the same thing. In Deuteronomy 11, he says the same thing. The law of God shall be in your hand and be frontlets between your eyes. And that adds new meaning to the mark of the beast. To have it in the forehead means that you have made an, a mental ascent Two, not following Christ. These are symbols. In the hand means your actions, and in the forehead it means in your faith, in your worship. You can take that mark either way. You may not mentally ascend to it, and you may just grasp it and say, well, I don't really agree, but I'll go along with it because, well, I value my life. It says it's in the hand and in the forehead. They've got the law and the covenant of the beast in their actions and in their worship. In this war over worship, the beast has a powerful ally. After seeing the first beast rise up out of the sea, John sees another beast and tells us the second beast is the one that will force the world to worship the first beast. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. To cause someone to do something means you're using force. And in this prophecy, the second beast will use its power to cause or force the inhabitants of the earth to worship the first beast.